Hi everyone, uh, we're going to continue to talk about Title IX, some expanded um, information about Title IX. I want to just draw your attention to the fact that at the on the video, the most recent video, the most previous video, um, at the end of the video I, I asked you to email me a couple questions. So uh, only one of you has done that so far, so either you forgot or you didn't make it to the end of the video or you're not watching the video or videos, but either way, I need you all to make sure you watch that most recent Title IX video from last week. Um, listen to what the question is that I ask you to um, respond to via email and make sure you do that for me. Um, that's an important thing um, for us to kind of conduct a little bit of discussion around Title IX, this topic of Title IX. Um, so you'll you'll see that the the two most recent slideshows on this week's materials has to do with some sort of expansion of Title IX, talking about it specifically around athletics and what it means, how you show Title IX compliance in your athletic department at the college level, and then um, it also is the governance structure of how women's collegiate athletics came into the NCAA, or how the NCAA um, st started supporting women's college athletics, how we got to that point where they became under the umbrella of the NCAA, um, as well as the NAI and other governing institutions, governance institutions for women's college sports. Um, so we're going to focus this video segment on the expansion of and looking at just the specific part of Title IX that covers athletics in, in the educational setting um, and talk about what schools are required to do to show compliance with Title IX. There are, um, there are three specific uh, sort of checkpoints that universities have to show, colleges and universities have to show in order to demonstrate that they are in compliance with Title IX. Those three areas are offer male and female students equal opportunities to play sports, treat male and female athletes equally, and then give male and female athletes the same um, or a fair share, sorry, a fair share of scholarship money. So we're going to talk about what those three specific components mean. What do those three requirements talk about? How do we break those down more specifically? So what does it mean to say equal opportunities? Equal opportunities to play sports, um, does it literally mean equal, one for one? Does it mean um, that we have exact roster numbers that match up? Uh, does it mean that we have the exact same sports on the women's side as we do on the men's side? Uh, so what it means to provide equal opportunities is that you have to um, show what's, you have to meet or satisfy what is, uh, called by the law, the th uh, you have to hit one of the three prongs. So in order to demonstrate equal opportunity, you have to satisfy one of the three prongs, and one of those three prongs um, need to be clearly documented that you have fulfilled it. So the three prongs of demonstrating equal opportunity is first, proportionality. Proportionality means that the percentage of male and female athletes at in, in, in your institution is relatively the same percentage as the male and female student body um, that are enrolled at the school. So, for example, if you have 55% female students and you have and you have 45% male students, your athletic rosters should re, re, should reflect that same percentage, that same proportion: 55% female athletes, 45% male athletes within a couple percentage points. So it could be like 53, 52%, and then 47, 48% um, female, male. Conversely, if it's the opposite, like, you know, 40% female and 60% male enrolled at your institution, then your, your roster should reflect that. Most institutions of higher learning, most, not all, but most, have more women enrolled than men right now in, in our time and our history um, of higher education. So typically, most athletic departments need to demonstrate that more female athletes are on their rosters than male. And that's total rosters on both sides of sports. So all the female sports put together and all the male sports put together. So sometimes what you'll see at institutions is there are more female sports than men's sports, but a lot of times that is so that the female sport can offset a sport like football, uh, men's lacrosse, baseball. Those are sports that carry pretty traditionally pretty large roster numbers. And so what they've done to help offset that, if they can't 
fulfill, fulfill the numbers required um, on the women's side through the sports that sort of match up with the men's sports, they'll have an extra or two sports on the women's side. So sometimes you'll see, um, you know, sometimes you'll see like a softball team and not a baseball team in an institution, or you'll see volleyball on the women's side, but no male volley men's volleyball. Um, sometimes you'll see a crew team on the women's side, but no male men's crew. Um, those are sort of sports that have a little bit bigger rosters. Gymnastics is another popular one that they'll have for women, but not for men. Sometimes swimming for women, not for men. The, the, when you see that, typically what that is is in response to the fact that they don't, they're out of proportionality. They're not meeting those numbers that reflect the enrollment at the institution in terms of percentage of women as student athletes to male student athletes. So one of the three pronged tests is proportionality. They can show, an institution can show that the percentage of male and female student athletes is about the same as the percentage of male and student, female students enrolled at the institution. Or if they cannot show proportionality, uh, which most institutions do, they just make sure that their rosters are, are syncing up according to the general enrollment. Um, if, but if they don't and they're way off, you know, let's say they're off by seven or eight percentage points, nine, ten, some schools are off 12 to 15 percentage points, then that school must fulfill one of the other two prongs. One is that they show a history of continuing to expand athletic opportunity for female students. Um, and it's, and that's because usually they're the ones that have been given the fewer chances to participate. So they need to be continually adding women's programs. And if they do that and they're out of proportionality, they're showing that they're demonstrating an opportunity for more women to get involved in athletics. Or the last one is that they have to demonstrate that they have fully met the needs of the women and needs and the interest of the women, um, enrolled in their institution or would enroll in their institution. That's a pretty tough one to completely demonstrate. That's why most schools really try to check off that first proportionality prong um, because it is really the easiest to try to fulfill uh, fill rosters on the women's side and you know sort of watch your roster sizes on the men's side. Um, though the the showing that you're fully meeting male and female um, interests and abilities there's a lot that you have to do for that. You have to do lots of surveys, not just of your, your current enrollment and your current population at your institution, but you have to do um, a survey of sort of interested applicants to the institution, the ones that didn't come, why they didn't come, what, what did the university not have that they would be interested in. Um, and so there's quite a lengthy process you have to go to show and document that you are actually legitimately fulfilling the interests and abilities of the women at your institution. So that's what it means to provide equal opportunity. That's the first um, part of showing that you're in compliance or you're meeting um, your requirement when it comes to Title IX. So that's the first of the three. And the first one in terms of um, equal opportunities to play sports has one of those, you have to check off one of those three prongs in order to show that you are, you are providing equal opportunities to play sports. So then what is fair treatment? What does it mean to treat male and female athletes fairly. Well, fair treatment means making sure that male and female athletes receive equal benefits and services from their school. It does not mean actually equal, like equal dollar for dollar, but it means equitable. So you need to have equal quality and quantity of equipment and supplies. You need to fairly schedule games and practices. That's both time and location. You can't you cannot um, give sort of a men's program um, prime practice time and prime game time on prime days and then let your women have sort of fill-in dates or um, get the cruddy practice times or the non-preferred practice practice times. Um, you have to have equal support for travel and expenses. You need to have fairness in assigning quality coaches and paying for them. Um, so if you're doing like extensive searches for male coaches, but you're just sort of doing local searches or you're hiring, continually hiring within on the women's side, you're not giving um, those women's programs the same opportunity at uh, a nationwide search to find the best candidate that can run their program. And that's an, a requ sort of a requirement of all athletic programs. Um, that you need to provide equal facilities or um, equitable facilities, locker rooms, fields, arenas, uh, for example, and anything along with that. Um, so there's there's a lot of um, there's a lot of checkpoints. There's about eleven different areas that 
uh, you kind of have to go through and make sure that you are treating male and female athletes fairly. The National Women's um, the National Women's Law Center, and we're going to talk about some other resources for people um, to check with, uh, if they have questions about Title IX compliance at their institution. Um, the National Women's Law Center is a resource that people can use that provides information on Title IX and how to sort of check the compliance of your institution with Title IX if you're achieving um, the level of compliance that you should be as an institution and whatnot. And one of the things the National Women's Law Center, the NWLC, provides is a checklist literally called the Check It Out Guide or the Check It Out List. The Check It Out, the check it out List is helps you identify um, the good things that you're doing as an institution to show equity as well as the areas in which you're probably falling short. And so the check it out list can literally be a way for you to like step through and say, okay, we are, we are short on this area. We are not fulfilling this um, need for both of our, for both genders of our athletes. Um, here are ways that we can improve. Here are things we're doing really well. Um, and, and sort of things that you can feel really good about the fact that you're, you're kind of nailing, you know, nailing the target on. Um, so that is the actual, um, list. You know, if you're ever curious, like what, what was my high school experience? Like, were they pretty equitable? Um, what about my cup, my current experience? You could, you can literally go on to the National Women's Law Center site and you can, pull a check it out list and you can literally go through the list yourself like ask yourself the series of questions it's a multi-page document it is a lot so it is they it's a pretty thorough checklist of things to make sure that you're treating both male and female athletes equitably um, and then the last area to show that you're in compliance um, with Title IX in athletics is a fair share of scholarships and this means that the percentage of athletic scholarship money awarded to male and female athletes should be within 1% of the respective participation rates unless the school can show why a bigger gap is not discriminatory. So here again, we're looking at numbers. We're looking at how many women and how many men are participating in sports and how much percentage of the scholarship dollars are being awarded to the male and female athletes um, and the, the that the school needs to be within one percentage point of those participation rates. And if they're not, they need to demonstrate why they are not. Um, and again, this is where you're going to, if you have any kind of familiarity with um, schools that offer scholarships that you may hear, uh, you know, that the um, women's volleyball team has X amount of full scholarships and X amount of partial scholarships, where the men's, um, say, tennis team has one full scholarship. Or um, you may hear, you know, the um, women's swimming program has four full scholarships um, and two partials, and the men's team has one partial, or, you know, one full and two partial, or no scholarships. And so, again, this is a decision by an administration to decide where they're putting their scholarship dollars and as you probably could assume, football tends to absorb a lot of scholarship dollars at a lot of institutions. So typically, if you see an institution where women's programs, um, compared to their male counterparts, their equal male counterparts, seem to have more scholarship dollars funneled to them than their male counterparts, it's probably to offset the fact that they're putting a lot more money into football. And that's pretty common. That's not, uh, that's not a criticism. It's just a reality that that's how a lot of administrators make their decisions budgetarily on how they're going to distribute scholarship dollars so that they meet that percentage of participation with the amount of dollars that are awarded to student athletes at their institution. So, um, so you, you know, if you hear like they're a scholarship school, it doesn't necessarily mean that every sport at that institution has the same equal dollars going to every single sport. Um, so that's an important thing to know. Um, again, the, uh, that's an administrative decision. That isn't made by anyone outside the institution. It's made within the institution. So every school is a little bit different in how they use their scholarship do dollars. So the bottom line is that schools must give male and female students alike a fair chance to play sports. They must provide them with equal support and they must have... Um, you know, a pretty fair, like equal treatment within their athletic programs. And I always tell people, you know, if you're a male athlete and you look over at the female athletes and you're, and you say to yourself, 
I would take how they're being treated as an athlete. I would, I would be in their program. I'd be happy to be in their program. I'd be satisfied. I'd be happy. I'd be as fulfilled. I'd feel like I'm getting every opportunity I can to be successful. Then you're probably at an institution that, um, is treating their athletes fairly, student athletes fairly. If you're a female athlete and you're looking over at the male men and you're like, why do they get this, this, that, and this? How come they get you that? That's not fair. That doesn't seem fair. If you're asking a lot of, or stating a lot of things like that, you may be potentially looking at some issues with Title IX. Sometimes that it's not a gender thing. Sometimes it's a program or like sport specific thing. It's not even about male female. Um, and of course, unfortunately, that's not a cover under Title IX. Um, but if it tends to be that the women are looking over at the men's sports and they're like, wait a second, you know, why do they get to travel this way and have these kinds of meals and this amount of uniforms and this kind of gear? And that's pretty consistent across the board that you may be looking at some Title IX concerns. Um, and I, and again, I always do say to the men, like, if you'd look at your female counterparts in your sport and you'd be like, oh yeah, I could be very successful. I'd feel very supported. I'd have a great experience. Um, I would totally trade places with them in terms, in terms of resources and their opportunity to participate in sport. And they would say that beyond a shadow of a doubt, then probably in a good situation in terms of equity. So it's like, that's kind of just a good little, like, sort of, you know, um, quick measure, a way of sort of looking at, okay, are we in a good place as an institution or not? So there are a number of resources that you can um, count on to help in terms of looking at or, like, considering if you're, quite, you know, if that question is, like, the one I just ha said that, you know, I tell female athletes to ask themselves, like, uh, does that seem like they're getting treated the same way we are? Are they getting more? Do they, does it seem like they're getting treated better? If you're asking those kinds of questions, there's lots of resources out there that you can turn to. Um, the federal based resource is uh, uh, under the Department of Education. It's the Office of Civil Rights. So under the Department of Education, the Office of Civil Rights manages Title IX, every area of Title IX, all 10 aspects. So anything from sexual harassment issues to um, employment opportunities um, to you know access to grant money for science research for female students to athletic opportunity, if there's a concern about equitable treatment or access or opportunity to those things um, in an educational setting, then the Office of Civil Rights would handle that complaint. Um, there is about, um, you know, the Office of Civil Rights has about 12 regional office offices. And the unfortunate thing is, is that um, the Office of Civil Rights is pretty busy. <laughs> and so there's about a two year time lapse when you make a complaint, um, unless it's really egregious and really obvious. Um, so it's a, it's a little bit of a, it's a little bit of a concern if you're going to make a complaint with the Office of Civil Rights in the Department of Education that um, it's going to take a little time. And in all honesty, some of the Title IX, um, some of the Title IX um, sort of, some of the, some of the components of Title IX that institutions have had an obligation to uphold have been pulled back a little bit by the current administration. So there's a little bit of a, there's a little bit of a um, setback because of that, because there's some um, unclear, you know, sort of processes that institutions have to go through um, related to what they used to have to be required to do in terms of protecting students with, in terms of Title IX. So it's become a little bit of a backlog um, if you're making a formal complaint at, at the federal level to the Office of Civil Rights, but that is, a, a, that is an avenue people can go through. There are also non-governmental um, resources, so the National Women's Law Center, National Women's Law Center, the NWLC, which I just um, referred to with the check it out um, with the check it out um, list they're the, sort of the most kind of um, prominent one that people would use the National Women's Law Center is an organization that uses the law in all its forms um, they get new laws in the books they and they are get them make sure they're enforced they litigate groundbreaking cases in state and at the federal level all the way up to the Supreme Court you you'll see the National Women's Law Center trying cases at the Supreme Court level. They educate the public about ways to make law and public policies work better, um, and particularly for women and their families. And so uh, the National Women's Law Center is very much tied into the protection of Title IX and how it works and operates in an educational setting. The Women's Sports Foundation, WSF, this is sort of the leading authority. This is a nonprofit organization that's like the leading authority on the participation 
of girls, women, and women in sport. It's advocacy. Um, it, it advocacy for equity. Um, education. It educates the pu the public. Um, it conducts research. It offers travel and training grants to amateur athletes, particularly around the Olympics. Uh, around the Olympics. Um, and it promotes sport and physical activity for girls and women. It was founded by Billie Jean King, who if you don't know who she is, you will know about her within the next few weeks. She is a very an incredible humanitarian, <clears throat> excuse me, former professional tennis player who helped found the Women's Sports Foundation and was the first president. Um, the, the American Association for University Women, AAUW, um, this is a this is a this is an organization that advances equity for women and girls through advocacy, education, and research. This is um, sort of a, the AAUW breaks through educational economic barriers so that all women have a fair chance, um, particularly through education um, opportunities. Uh, so a lot a lot of times you'll see like professors as members of the AAUW. Um, in terms of helping women and, like I said, in an educational setting. Now, the National Organization for Women is the largest organization of feminist activists in the United States. Um, NOW's goal has always been to take action and bring equity for all women. Um, it works to eliminate discrimination and harassment in the workplace, in schools, um, you know, the justice system, and any kind of form of sectors of society. Um, they sort of secure... Um, birth control and reproduction rights for all women. Um, they end forms of violence against women. It eradica eradicates racism, sexism, homophobia, promotes equality. I mean, the National Organization for Women has been around for a long time. It's a very visible organization, a very, um, very um, active organization, and they are very concerned about the the security of Title IX, especially because they want to protect women in an educational environment um, to be able to get their education education free of harassment and with equal opportunity as those around them of the male gender. And then Girls Inc. is the last one. Um, this is a national nonprofit youth organization that's dedicated to inspiring all girls at the youth level to be strong, smart, and bold. Um, it has roots that date back to the mid-1800s. And it's a pretty vital educational um, organization, and a lot of times you'll find um, that's a really great resource when you're at the interscholastic level or youth level is to go to Girls Inc. and ask them for support and help on how to sort of navigate concerns or issues you might have around Title IX. Um, so those are the main sort of components I want to talk about with expansion of the law and talking about it specifically with athletics. Um, there are some... Um, there are there are some um, in the PowerPoint that talks about athletics in terms of Title IX. There are some um, applications of the law and so actual like court cases. Um, there's an instance of Jack Mowat from Washington D.C. who sort of saw some discrepancies in his daughter's experience and his male, his son's experience at the high school level. Um, there is a instance of a of a woman named Joanne Barr from Heartland, Wisconsin, who um, she too saw some um, issues with um, what happened when she complained about some experiences with her daughter and some retaliation, um, and some and sort of learning about how um, you are protected under Title IX with retaliation. If you make a complaint, you cannot. You cannot be retaliated against. Um, there is another issue with uh, there's another court case of a woman who played at Duke University for the football program, um, and the um, the fact that she needed to be allowed to participate in the football program couldn't be cut from the football program as long as she was physically capable to participate and contribute to the pro program because Duke doesn't have a women's football program, um, and so there was a. Um, there was a there's a court case about that. Um, another one of an umpire that recognized um, some issues with field fields for softball um, for the girls who played softball versus the baseball fields that were provided to boys. Um, so there's lots of these instances of applications of the law. Um, I'm not going to go more specifically into those right now because 
um, I want to keep moving on the governance structure. Um, so I'm going to move on to that in the next video. But before I close out this, this little segment, I want to make sure that you um, know and understand that there are resources here uh, on our campus that you can go to if you have any issues around your experience um, educationally. So again, access to things, um, you know, how you're being treated in the in the educational setting, um, equity in terms of concerns with athletics. Um, there's sort of three contexts that deal with Title IX issues on our campus. The first one is Dean Casey Gill. There's a slide, the, the last slide on this PowerPoint gives you the names of these people. Dean Casey Gill, who's um, sort of the, the Deputy Title IX Director, so she sort of oversees all of Title IX issues and complaints. Um, Gwen Owen, who's the Director of Student Conduct and, Title, and a Title IX Officer, specifically around sexual harassment or misconduct um, at the student level. And then Kelly Hubble, Coach Kelly Hubble, who is the Senior Women's Administrator um, in the Athletic Department, she would handle, and also a Title IX Officer who handles any issues about Title IX in athletics. Um, so you have resources, your first initial resources and your first stop here if you have any issues at the university are with those three individuals. Um, you could also go to HR. That would be also just an option. Mary Beth Walters is the director of HR and she would be an option there for you also. Hopefully you won't need those resources, but if you feel like you do, those would be the options for you to reach out to. Um, so the next video is going to talk about the governance structure um, and we will talk about how the whole development of that and women's college athletics at a national level um, in the next video.